So I do have a couple like introductory slides. So um, maybe this is uh, redundant for everyone in this room, but maybe we have a couple of viewers um, who don't know. So um, I guess what I, I, so I'm just going to give kind of like an overview of Open Bazaar a little bit, and then I think kind of what I want to do with this talk is just talk about kind of my vision for this conference is called like Satoshi's vision. I kind of want to talk about my, you know my vision for Open Bazaar how that fits in with what, at least what I view to be Satoshi's vision for Bitcoin. Um, I hope I'm not being terribly presumptuous on that, but, um, but we'll see. So, um, you know, what is Open Bazaar? I've got a couple of nice headlines here that I like. This is um, Forbes magazine. Um, Open Bazaar is an anarchist eBay on acid. So, um, <laughs> you know, I, I kind of like that, right? I can, I can run with that title. Um, this was uh, Fortune magazine, you know, America's most dangerous startup. Um, you know, I'll, I'll take that title too, I guess. You know, then, you know, if, if you're a core supporter, then you know, Open Bazaar is a scam, and uh, you know, it's it's a <laughs> it's a failed project. You know, useless. You name it. We, we've heard it all from them. Um, you know, so so what is it? It's I mean, essentially, Open Bazaar is an e-commerce app. Um, it's an app that allows people to buy and sell, uh, to list products for sale. This is, this is a screenshot of the app, um, how it works. This, this girl's located in um, Arkansas. And so this is her store. She's selling uh, artwork that she makes. I've actually bought something from her on air. And um, it's a little bit, I guess you could maybe say, maybe a little bit more like Etsy in terms of like you set up a, an actual store and people can browse it and buy things from you, um, or eBay, I guess you could say. Uh, we don't sell anything um, ourselves on there. I guess, I guess maybe we sell some t-shirts, but it's primarily an app that allows other people to buy and sell. So you can say, you know, what's, what's so unique about that, right? There's a million e-commerce applications, you know, Amazon, eBay, you know, they just dominate everything, you know. Why does Open Bazaar exist? And it's, um, it's, it's really, like a fundamentally different technology than what we have with the web. So Open Bazaar could be thought of as, I don't, I don't really want to say the first, but maybe, maybe one of the first well done, you know, if we can pat ourselves on the back, kind of well done app that could fit into this kind of web 3.0 paradigm, um, which is kind of like the new decentralized web. So the way the web um, works today is we have the image on the left, it's the centralized client server model. So you have all these clients, and in order to fetch data, they have to connect to this single server to download data to, in the case of an e-commerce application, to make transactions. And so we just have this like one corporation in the middle here that like controls everything. It controls what you see, what you can do with their app, and what have you. Whereas the new model is this more decentralized web. So um, Open Bazaar is. Uh, we're, we're building on top of a protocol called IPFS that some people may have heard of. IPFS itself, it combines um, ideas from uh, BitTorrent and Git and Kademlia. These are, all, these are all concepts that have been around for over a decade, but we're just kind of now combining them in a way that allows us to build really useful stuff with it. Um, so we can ask, you know, what are some of the benefits here? Um, if we just look at the architecture on the left, it's it's kind of like a, to some extent, a really inefficient architecture. Like, let's say, let's say we have a scenario where you want to download an image from a server. It could be the case that every one of those other clients have already downloaded the image, and that you know they've got it in their browser cache or whatever it is. And instead of downloading it from those people who already have it, you're instead going to go and download it from that central server anyway. So everyone's just going to bombard the central server with requests when the data you're looking for is actually spread around you know, thousands of computers that are already on the internet. So it's kind of uh, inefficient when you think about it from, from this perspective. And it's also, you know, we see in times when sites come under heavy load, they slow down, right? If everyone is trying to request stuff at, all at once, you know, websites can just grind to a halt sometimes. So what we have with this other architecture that we're using um, with IPFS is the data, whenever you download something, the data is cached locally. In your on your node in your in your browser, and that data is essentially made available in a way that anyone else who's looking for it can find it. So when you go to download something, you just download it from anyone else who had previously downloaded it, and we eliminate that need for that 
that kind of central server that controls everything. Um, and unlike the, the client server architecture where things uh, slow down, you know, when everyone just bombards the server with requests, in IPFS things actually speed up, right? Because you have, you know, let's say you have a big file, it's broken up into chunks, and you can start downloading these chunks from a bunch of other people and then you can reassemble it. And what happens is the more people who are downloading these chunks, the more they're making it available, so you actually end up with faster downloads um, of the content as a result. And what's probably really interesting for us, in addition to just kind of a, a more, like a better architecture, better architectural design for the web, is it creates uh, kind of a form of censorship resistance. So all of this content is spread around hundreds or thousands of computers on the internet. There isn't that central computer in the middle, that central server, who can deny you access to data or dictate how you're using um, you know, the app. So if we think about in terms of um, you know, like e-commerce applications, this implies that you know, where people can essentially trade with each other without, um, you know, without anyone being able to stop them or kind of censor that trade. So just to kind of give you an example, this is I know one of my favorite headlines here, um, which is our <laughs> Witches are furious at Etsy for banning the sale of spells, right? So this is maybe not the worst thing that can happen as a result of uh, censorship, but although, but these people have been disenfranchised. Um, yeah, so, but th this is a direct result of that architectural design where you have that one company in the middle that gets to make these type of decisions. And when we talk about this in terms of, um, you know, we could look at this from a couple of perspectives, but we have, you know, Etsy's not even that big of a company, but when you talk about bigger companies like Amazon and eBay, you know, these companies, like, you know, one decision that they make, you know, can have, like, a chilling effect, you know, throughout, you know, the, the entire economy just because of how big they are. We see this with, like, um, you know, with, like, YouTube and Facebook and, and the, the free speech battles that are going on. It's just because they're just so darn big, um, you know, that one decision from them just affects everybody. So you know, by having this kind of more decentralized model, we can kind of get around this. So, um, what else did I want to say? Uh, hold on, let me get out my, I actually wrote some notes to make sure I didn't forget anything. Okay, yeah, so basically, I mean, at the end of the day, what we're, what we're trying to do here is, is basically kind of create like a, a free trade zone for the internet, right? I don't know about you guys, but I, you know, I believe that you know, people have essentially a fundamental human right to free trade, right? And we see this, so I mentioned you know, kind of large corporations, large entities can kind of be a threat to that stuff. We also have governments, right? So in, when we talk, we, we kind of think that we have like the ability to trade freely with each other, but when you like take a step back and you look at it, we've got, um, th there are more uh, regulations regarding what we're allowed to trade, how we're allowed to trade it, when we're allowed to trade it, that you couldn't possibly read all those regulations in your lifetime if you wanted to. And um, so, you know, regardless of, of how well Open Bazaar does, I actually think there's a, a pretty strong case for Open Bazaar as just like a mainstream e-commerce application because if you're a, uh, a seller who's selling stuff, you know, there's no middleman, there's no one taking any cut of, of, the, of the transaction. So this can save you maybe 10%, 15%, depending on what platform you're using. And you know, if you consider the profit margins that many of these sellers have, they're real tiny. So this is potentially talking about seeing your profits increase by three, four, five X just by cutting out the middleman. But even if Open Bazaar doesn't um, achieve that kind of um, sort of maybe mainstream adoption, you know, I still kind of fundamentally believe that this is, this is a type of platform that just like, it just needs to exist, right? Like even if, even if Amazon's fine for like 99% of the, your transactions out there or the things that you wanna buy, there's always going to be people who are, you know, victimized by censorship, they're disenfranchised, um, you know, they're, they're threatened with imprisonment for trying to buy things, you know, as innocuous as like medicine to, you know, help them ease their pain or whatever it is. So, you know, pe people have a right to trade with each other. And so, you know, Open Bazaar is, is trying to be this, this like free trade zone 
where at le you'll always know there's at least some place you can trade with people where you're not going to be censored or prohibited from doing so. So, you know, obviously this kind of trans transitions nicely into Bitcoin. So, you know, what good is all this technology, this kind of decentralized way of sharing data and pushing data around the network, if, um, you know, we just, at the end of the day, we just have to pay people in like Visa and MasterCard, right? Um, so Bitcoin being a, a decentralized, uh, like censorship resistant currency just fits in like perfectly with Open Bazaar. So we get, from Open Bazaar, we get a, uh, you know, we get a decentralized payment, payment system that just keeps our entire platform decentralized and makes the whole thing work. You know, Bitcoin gets from Open Bazaar, you know, we have a mechanism where you can kind of like, you can b you spend what you earn on there, right? The, I don't know about you guys, but like the, kind of the, the purpose of Bitcoin as I see it is not to like cash out into fiat at the end of the day, but it's to, it's to get that, that crypto economy going, that, that kind of um, counter economy, right? And maybe this, this is probably where I go off on a little bit of a tangent, but this is like what I what I view in my vision, like what we're doing here. We're we're fundamentally building a counter economy, um, kind of whether we realize it or not. Um, give me one second. Okay, so yeah, um, so I know many people in this room, um, you know, myself, I know Roger, uh, you, guys, you guys heard Roger talk about a lot of this um, earlier, but you know, we come at this from like a pretty strong like libertarian perspective. So, um, you know, us libertarians, we spent, um, I, I don't know what, decades like lobbying the government to try and like re-implement the gold standard, right? Re-implement the gold standard, try to, get sound money and it's it's like totally useless right didn't you know didn't even make a dent all that effort and it's kind of like you know why would it make an effort because they have you know they're the recipients of all this largesse they have like no incentive to change anything um so maybe this maybe this might be a good time to kind of do a little bit of review of like why why bitcoin anyway like why not fiat money um i just got i got like maybe three points that i can um talk about as it relates to fiat money. So the first is certainly from like our libertarian perspective, it's we have with fiat money, what we see is this like upwards redistribution of wealth kind of from like the poor and middle class to the rich. So how does that actually happen in practice? Well, consider like, you know, people counterfeit money for a reason, right? Like when you, when you counterfeit money, you're actually, um, you're, you're getting a real economic benefit from that. You get goods and services and you don't actually produce anything, right? You just produce pieces of paper or whatever it is. And so um, the counterfeiter has this like real benefit, but so does the merchant that the counterfeiter bought from. Because if the merchant, if this is a good counterfeit and you can't tell it apart, the merchant sees his income increase as a result of this. And so the merchant sees his income go up before the you know, inflation hits. So this confers a real economic benefit there. And so on and so forth throughout the economy. So we see a scenario where the early spenders of the money, like the people who are close to the source, their income goes up before the inflation hits, and then everyone else sees the inflation hit before their income goes up, creating like this real like upward redistribution of wealth. And when we talk about you know central banks counterfeiting money, which is basically what they do, um, it's that new money, the, the people who are the first spenders of it, who are close to the source. It's the banks, the large financial institutions, Wall Street corporations. So we have this scenario where like average people are paying a tax to the bank every year. And most people don't even really know it, but effectively that's what's going on. And it's, it's not just this tax to the bank, but then you know, this money is used to buy primarily government bonds. This pushes down interest rates on you know, government borrowing, which lets them finance all this stuff that they otherwise wouldn't be able to do. Like, we're, we're, we're going on like close to 20 years in Afghanistan, right? Just like perpetual war um, in Afghanistan. And so it's not just, you know, it's that, we're financing like, you know, drone strikes on people's weddings and all this stuff. So, um, You know, and then I guess lastly, it has like this like fundamentally like destabilizing effect in the economy. So it's like, 
you know, they, they take all this money, they dump it into the laps of the large financial institutions, it pushes down these, these interest rates, and it makes all these loans that were otherwise unprofitable loans or bad loans, it makes them look like good loans on paper, right? So it creates these like asset bubbles. Um, and if you go back and you read like, you know, the very first um, post that Satoshi put out there introducing Bitcoin um, in like uh, February 2009, he talked about, you know, banks, the reason for Bitcoin was, you know, banks were like loaning out all this um, money in like waves of credit bubbles, right? Um, so this is like baked in like right in the, the reason why Bitcoin exists. It's a very kind of libertarian reason. So, you know, we spend decades trying to lobby the government for, um, for you know, like a return to the gold standard to end all of this stuff. And, you know, like along comes, oops, along comes Satoshi and who, you know, he may or may not be speaking after me, I don't, we don't know. But, um, but, you know, like along comes Satoshi and he's just like, you know, I'm, you know, for, forget all like, you know, lobbying the government, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna do it anyway, I'm not gonna ask for permission. So he puts out this, this alternate, you know, competing like, you know, market-based currency and he's like, the way that we're, the way we're gonna end the Fed, the way that we're going to, um, you know, the, and the ECB and all the fiat money is we're gonna put out a superior alternative and we're gonna outcompete it, right? And to me, that's, that's like the really powerful vision for Bitcoin, that's why I got into Bitcoin, that's why Roger got into Bitcoin, I know that's why a lot of people here. And it's, we're kind of fundamentally like building a counter economy, we're trying to get as much economic activity moving out of fiat and into Bitcoin as we can. And even if you think that's like a really bad idea, like even if you're on like the Paul Krugman side or Joseph Stiglitz or these type of people who would probably dramatically disagree with everything I just said, like Bitcoin's probably still gonna prove to be a pretty useful experiment in that regard to get us like actual real world data for how these type of market-based systems work. And it can inform our, our view of like monetary economics um, going forward. So um, just wanna say like a couple words about Bitcoin Cash. All right, when, so I, I won't make your eyes, uh, but um, so, you know, that's, that's what I kind of view as like Satoshi's vision. I think it, it fits very well into like Open Bazaar and what we're trying to do and create this, this kind of like, you know, free trade zone kind of outside of state control. And, you know, that's the vision that, that many of us who got into Bitcoin very early on, I was in Bitcoin since like 2012. Um, you know, that's a vision that, that attracted us into this. And here we come along with the core developers and they're like, well, we have a radically different vision for Bitcoin. Um, you know, our vision for Bitcoin, or speaking as them, our vision for Bitcoin is, you know, just this kind of like, you know, speculative trading asset, right? That it's, it's not gonna be money, there's not gonna be any counter economy, you know, no one's gonna be buying stuff with it. It's just gonna be this, this like speculative trading token with $30 transaction fees, right? And so it's like, I, yeah, it's, it's just like, I mean, that's, it, that's not what I got into Bitcoin for. I know that's um, not what anyone else did. Um, and I, I don't know about you guys, but when you think of like all the, the use cases for this technology, uh, like store of value is gonna be like the most boring one out of all of them, right? And it's, um, so, you know, as far as Bitcoin Cash goes, like I'm, you know, I don't, if they wanna work on store of value and you know, they wanna have a trading asset and whatever it is, I mean, that's fine, I'm, you know, I'm happy to let them do it, but, you know, I'm gonna be over here, like, working on Bitcoin Cash with all the rest of you guys, so, um, I guess that's just what I'm gonna talk about, thank you. Test, test, test. Test, okay. Thank you, Chris. All right, here we go to the Q&A. And we got some awesome questions for Chris. Hey, great talk. Um, can you tell us a bit about the uh, uh, protocol for actually the distribution of content? And particularly, uh, I already asked one question about URIs today, but like the URI scheme and what that resolves to. Um, distribution of digital content? No, just, you know, where do the images and the content in the app come from? And I see you've got the OB URI at the top. Yeah, so they... Uh, and I saw IPFS reference, and I just wondered. Yeah, they, so nodes will, like, seed your own con their own content, so it's, like, um, 
if, if, you pub, if you make a new store and you put out some content, Node seed that and make it available to anyone, then when anyone else comes around, they download it and they make it available to every other people, every other person. So kind of by itself, IPFS, it doesn't provide any guarantees that your content will remain available. Um, so it, you know, if, if everyone else who had downloaded your content goes offline, then your content's not available to other people, but it's, um, uh, we also have this like pub sub mechanism in there where like people can subscribe to updates from other nodes and, and they can like proactively seed that content if they want to. So haven't really kind of enabled that that yet, but what I want to do is kind of give people the ability to say like, you know, I'll reseed maybe a gigabyte worth of data or something like that. I mean, right now it's kind of like a volunteer thing. I don't know if it needs to be anything more than a volunteer thing, but I guess, I guess we'll see. Yeah. We got a question on the left. Hi. Um, so as it is now uh, with OB, you can use both Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, and Zcash. Um, I've played around with it a little bit, but I'm not 100% sure. When you create a store, you have to create a new store for each of the three currencies, and they're not interoperable. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, I mean, the stores are all part of the same network, but you're right. That was just kind of like the quickest path to getting something out the door. You know, our usage went from like, you know, it was spiking like really high and then you get $10 fees, $30 fees, and then usage starts going like this. So we just had to get like something out the door as quick as possible and that's what it was. So we are working on making it so you can kind of like, it'll be checkbox what you can use, which currencies you want, so you can use more than one. That'll be coming pretty soon. We have a question on the right. I got it. Yeah, sure. Here you go. Oh, thank you. Uh, great talk. Uh, I remember when you guys started, you had this idea of using Namecoin for the names of store, and uh, like currently the store is just like uh, huge strings of of uh, characters, names, yeah. letters, whatever. What's the idea for the for the future on the names of the stores? How's that going to work? Are you guys going to go back to using Namecoin, or how's how's that going to work? Thank you. Yeah. So we were using um, Blockstack, which was kind of like the um, the next uh, kind of evolution of that project, the one name project that was built on, on Namecoin. We might still use that, we probably still will at, at some point, but like Blockstack, it, it was starting to get very expensive to register names, and it got to the point where our users aren't gonna wanna pay $10 or $30 or whatever it was to register a name. So uh, we, did, we didn't take the time to actually implement that yet. Maybe we will at some point, we'll have to see. Um, alternatively, it does, I, on my side of the code on the back end, it does reg work actually with regular DNS. So like, um, so like, let, let's say there's a store that sells hot sauce. It's called Pex Peppers. Like he could have like pexpeppers.com, and if he just puts his like OpenBazaar ID in, in the text record, um, then he can resolve openbazaar.com and open in OpenBazaar, and it'll take it to his store. Um, that just hasn't made it into the UI yet, but that that functionality is actually there. And, whether that's authenticated or not, it kind of depends on like whether it's using DNSSEC and, and what have you. So that might be an alternative, but some kind of like blockchain-based naming systems, um, like Blockstack, if the fees remain low or something like that, it would be nice to implement too. Awesome. So I think we have a question in the back. Yeah. Hello. Thank you for the great talk. Uh, could you comment a little about the number of stores you have, the number of transactions, and how that is growing? Yeah, um, so I know the, the app has been downloaded like several hundred thousand times. It's, it's ha had a lot of downloads. In terms of like users online at any given point in time, it's like in the thousands and the stores, it's maybe like, I don't know, 500 to 1,000 stores online, maybe within like a week's period of time. Can only kind of like gauge like how, when was like the last time we've seen the store, you know, just by kind of crawling. Um, Usage, like I said, usage was going up pretty good until the fees hit and then it dropped way down. Still hasn't kind of recovered back up to that level. But I think we have, we still have a good amount of work to do just to get it to like, at least in my opinion, to get it to kind of like feature parity with like eBay and Etsy and this sort of stuff. So I think a big one is kind of like the browsing, improving the browsing experience. Because right now it's just kind of like loading random stuff. Um, I feel like you know having a better browsing experience is like key to having users, right? So and we still haven't still haven't fixed that or improved that in the app. Um, but that's one thing. We also would like to get like a web version going. 
Um, so you can use like OpenBazaar on the web. And there's actually, the IPFS guys have written this JS IPFS library, which it runs a full peer-to-peer -peer IPFS node in the browser, right? So you can, you can literally have like a peer-to-peer -peer app running in the browser, which is kind of like bleeding edge tech. So um, I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to get that at some point too. That might not be the first step for getting it in the browser, but that's kind of where I'd like to go with it. Um, and I mean, right now, OpenBazaar desktop nodes, they take WebSocket connections. So you can actually, I've, I've played around, you can have a, a web browser can communicate with the OpenBazaar network today. Um, it's just a matter of kind of like writing that code to make, to make it work. Um, was there a second part of that question that I missed? That, yeah, um, it, it, it was growing pretty well. I mean, it's, it's still, like I said, it still hasn't reached back to the point where it was in maybe like November when, you know, before the fees hit, but uh, we're getting back there. All right, any other questions? Got one more. Hey, great work on this. Uh, just wanted to uh, know uh, what are the strongest growing pains you're having and how can the community help uh, promote and help yeah, participate. Yeah, um, uh, I think growing pains, I mean, it's just, we, we just don't have enough resources to do everything we want to do, right? I'd like to have like 10 more developers if, if I could, but um, that's probably the, the most frustrating part is just like the speed at which it takes to develop stuff. But um, it's, it's been working surprisingly really well. Um, the network's been like really stable and if, if, if you knew everything it had to do to get the data to the user, it's like much faster than you would expect it to be, given what it's doing behind the scenes to gather all that data and, and bring it in. So it's, it's working pretty well from that, that standpoint. So um, I just think kind of like getting features out the door and kind of polishing it is, is like our, our biggest challenge at this point. Chris, thank you very much. A round of applause for Chris. Yeah.